Welcome, everybody. We have got Caleb Maupin here. The book, Where is America Going? Marxism, MAGA, and the Coming Revolution. We'd like to get into it. Caleb, how are you this morning? I'm good. How about you? I can't complain. If I did, it would take up time. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need that. Sure. Um, so, where is America going? That's the the opener. You, you gave us a very convenient title by uh, phrasing it as a question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I kind of quibbled with what the title might be, um, because I, I basically the training that I got as a Marxist was that uh, your job when giving an overall report is to explain what's happening, explain why it's happening, but then explain more importantly what to do about it. And I've noticed that many Marxist books have what they call the chapter five problem, which is they explain what's going on and they give a thorough analysis, and then it ends with, so maybe be a liberal activist, kind of, maybe? And then the, the chapter five, where they tell you what you're supposed to do, is extremely weak. Um, and they don't really have real answers. Um, and so I set out to put out this book. Now, mainly this book is a number of concepts that I've been talking about on my YouTube streams for the last several years. Um, I talked about how capitalism is a crisis of overproduction and we're, we're leading toward you know, a crisis rooted in the tendency of the falling rate of profit and technology and abundance under capitalism leading po to poverty and all the classic Marxist analysis. I talked about Bonapartism. Uh, I talked about uh, I talked about uh, the real meaning of fascism and what it is and the synthetic left. And I also then talked about the divisions in the ruling class and the potential openings for us to intervene. Um, and those are all things that I felt there was a need for them to be written down. You know, if you watch all my streams, you know, on YouTube, you'll get a, a sense of these understandings. But it needed to be really written down, and it also needed to be defended with citations and sources. And there's quite a long bibliography in this text, a lot of quotes from a lot of different thinkers. The problem of overproduction is one that anybody who was lucky enough to go to the CPI event recently in Washington D.C. got a very good explanation on. Um, can you expound on that here and maybe maybe tell people exactly where it goes in the book? Because I know it also leads us to the falling rate of profit. And, and Sure. Well, the understanding that Marxism has always had is that the problem with capitalism is that it's the only system in the world where greater wealth and greater abundance leads to greater poverty. In feudalism, in primitive hunter-gatherer civilization, all the systems that preceded capitalism— People were hungry because there were food shortages. It's only under capitalism you can have a situation where people become hungry, lose their jobs, there's layoffs, there's hunger because there's too much food. Donuts in the dumpster. Yeah. Uh, people, people can become homeless, and we saw this in the 2008 financial crisis, because there's too much housing. I mean, that's what happened. People couldn't keep up with buying houses at the rate that houses were being produced. There was too much housing. There's a huge amount of housing in America, and people were losing their homes, and there's tent cities. And now here in Washington, D.C., I mean, we see tents of homeless people everywhere, and there's housing everywhere. And it's not that it's just ironic that there's so much housing in America and so much homelessness. It's that homelessness is created by there being so much housing. Poverty is created by abundance, and that's the built-in problem of capitalism. However, the technological revolution and the computer revolution has made that problem, that built-in problem of capitalism, that ever-present problem, so much bigger because of the fact that computers are eliminating labor like you wouldn't believe. I mean, chat GPT, look what they can do. So there's so much less of a role of the worker in production that the rate of profit that the capitalist makes goes down, right? Only human labor creates value. Exactly, exactly. You get the... You explained it so eloquently at the event. Another thing that's present in this book that I think is very worth talking about is the counter gangs and the bread tube stuff. They, like you've been through that, obviously, the bread tube serves imperialism, but uh, I'm sure you went into much more detail in this book. Uh, where did you take that? Well, I didn't, this book. I didn't want to spend too much time on the bread tube stuff because I wrote a whole book about it. I mean, I mentioned it in passing because sure. it's important. But the, the main thing to talk about is that over the course of the 1970s, uh, after the U.S. was defeated in Vietnam, uh, the way the United States was able to kind of turn things around and ultimately win the Cold War was by kind of reinventing their strategy. Um, and when the Cold War started out, it was capitalism versus communism. The great... Uh, 
democratic Christian, you know, capitalist West versus the evil Marxist Leninist communists. And things happened like the Vietnam War, like the Korean War, like McCarthyism and you know, the USA was isolating itself and communists around the world were the champions of national liberation struggles, et cetera. And so communists, uh, communists actually were quite successful. But in the 1970s, Zbigniew Brzezinski and Henry Kissinger were kind of given the task of developing a new strategy. And part of that strategy was muddying the waters, playing the Soviet Union against China, manipulating uh, socialists against each other. We saw the, Euro the rise of Euro-communism in uh, Western Europe, where the various communist parties were kind of bribed and nudged into terminating their relationship with the Soviet Union. Um, and there was an effort to manipulate left-wing politics that was very successful. And by the time the Soviet Union ultimately fell, the global communist movement was in such confusion and chaos that, you know, I mean, you had situations like the Kampuchea War of 1978 where communists were killing communists. I think there was a, a Vietnam vet who said, you know, it was crazy. They said they sent me to Vietnam telling me my job was to fight communists. But now in Vietnam, uh, we have the United States backing the Cambodian communists to kill the Vietnamese communists, who are then being invaded by the Chinese communists, all on the grounds that they're being backed by the Soviet communists. And it was about that manipulation uh, and confusion of left-wing politics. That's how the USA was ultimately able to bring down the Soviet Union, disorienting the left-wing movements. And that term counter gang, let me just tell you real quick where that comes from. Mm -hmm. That comes from Kenya. Uh, and that was, you know, the Land and Freedom Army, the Mau Mau. They had a huge uprising against the British in the 1950s that was defeated. The way it was defeated was uh, British intelligence and military uh, strategist Frank Kitson developed what he called counter gangs, which were groups of people who acted like Mau Mau liberation fighters, but were actually working or being covertly supported by the British. They would commit atrocities that were blamed on the Mau Mau. Uh, they would sometimes claim the Mau Mau were selling out and they were the real anti-colonial heroes. And by sending these groups of people that looked like anti-colonial revolutionaries out to muddy the waters and confuse things, uh, they were able to diffuse uh, the struggle. And ultimately, we know what happened and the Kenyan Liberation Army and Liberation Movement was defeated. The British colonialists were successful. I brought that up after um, the uh, crisis of overproduction because ultimately that I think is it's it's so important to understand that to understand why we're not talking about things like the tendency of the rate of profit to fall the crisis of overproduction etc um but there's an interesting aspect to it in that you also touch on in chapter two which is about fascist ideology uh and how there really isn't a fascist ideology or aesthetic and uh the counter gangs and all those revolutionaries are just constantly focusing on the idea that there is a fascist ideology or aesthetic and that seems to primarily be what they're talking about and obviously you can kind of warp that to be whatever you want it to be it's ideology it's aesthetic you can you can say anyone's a fascist if you really want to and they do um how ultimately can we get back to talking about these important aspects of like the fundamental contradictions of capitalism that permeate themselves up to now the you know sort of extra super imperial stage that we are in today well in the book i point out that fascism is economic in its nature yeah. and that that our palm dutt who i think is one of the probably the most important dutt writer game. yeah I, i'm in, i'm 100 percent there with you on that yeah our palm dutt and his book fascism and social revolution which was written at the height of 1930s fascism 1934 he made clear that this is an economic system. This is an attempt to save capitalism. And the ideology and the aesthetic, all that's made up as they go along. Fascism is what they do. It's not what they say. And that what it is is that when capitalism enters a long-term economic crisis, the capitalists have to figure out a way to save their system. And the only way they can save their system is with mass destruction, driving down living standards, reducing consumption. And what the Nazis did is they created a, a, a layer of the population that were slave laborers in concentration camps. They restarted military spending. They crushed the labor movement and were able to kind of rejuvenate the economy of Nazi Germany for a few years. Um, and it was a mechanism to try and stabilize capitalism. And ultimately, it wasn't a long-term solution, and it led to the it Second World be. War. I mean, the, the, again, just returning to like the very root of the problem, the beginning of the book, that is not possible to change. It's just something that, you know, you get to a point where, you know, production is way past consumption 
and you're going to have to figure out a way to maintain the class supremacy of the bourgeoisie in some way. So ultimately, that kind of leads us into the coming triumph of illiberalism. And I'm just going to tee you up for this because I think that is just where you got to we have to be prepared for it, so we have to know what's coming. Well, when we talk about liberalism and illiberalism, this is a big conversation that a lot of academics have, right? Liberalism is the Western view that celebrates the rights of the individual above all else, right? It says the individual is great and that any form of collectivism is some kind of threat. And the, the ultimate expression of liberalism is philosophical irrationalism, and that's largely the teachings of Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, and you know his his you know his his work about you know the Ubermensch and the great individual who's suppressed by society, and you know the the work I draw from Lukacs who talks about how that was the basis of Nazism really that Nazism drew from from Nietzschean supremacism and contempt for the masses of people absolutely um, but through Heidegger yeah and what's interesting is that in the West that that liberalism, that ultra-liberalism, that philosophical irrationalism has become almost the ruling ideology. Um, Agreed. The, the main American or purveyor of it in American society was Ayn Rand. And Ayn Rand is a huge influence on U.S. culture, not simply among conservatives. Stacey Abrams, who's a liberal, she says Atlas Shrugged is the book that changed her life. She bases herself on that. And this is the belief that one should not have compassion, one should not have empathy, one should not have any loyalty to a country, a cause, a religion, or anything like that. One should simply be motivated by their own self-interest uh, and that anyone who tries to get you to be part of a larger group or something is trying to con you and scheme you. And that worldview used to be the worldview of the ultra-rich. They've always felt that way. They've always been self-interested and callous and cold and calculating. That's how they got to the top of the pyramid in capitalism. Of course. But they've been, you know, they've been foolish enough to spread their ideology all throughout U.S. society, and now the country is literally coming apart. And the elites don't even have any loyalty to each other. They're not all on the same team at this point. They're, they've all got competing economic interests, and they're fighting with each other because they have no real loyalty. Plus, the population uh, doesn't feel any particular loyalty, you know, to to anything, and society overall is coming apart. And this is the expression of political liberalism. Now, it's rooted in the capitalist system and the rule of profits, but it's taken to its logical conclusion. And ultimately, some kind of illiberalism will emerge. Now, my hope is that it's a socialist illiberalism. Um, Mine as well. Yeah. And, you know, there was then an ad recently that a lot of academics signed where they called out cancel culture and they referred to it as illiberal because there is an element of illiberalism in cancel culture, silencing free speech, taking action against people for the way they speak, imposing certain social rules on people. Um, and that that the ruling class is, is at the same time that they're, they're pushing this very, very extreme liberalism. They're also experimenting with little, little illiberal movements that might be necessary. Um, and it's this weird contradiction. And that, that one thing that's always pointed out is that liberalism is always propped up by illiberalism. Absolutely. All, all these people who say they believe in free speech and freedom of assembly and all of that, you know, and all these people who don't believe in re repression, you know, they're, they're living in a society that's propped up by the U.S. military, a highly collectivist, illiberal organization. They've got police, uh, you know, that are, you know, the way the FBI is trained. You look at it, all this, this belief that everyone should just think for themselves. There is no cause. They need, they need illiberal institutions to prop up their privilege of being ultra liberal and individualistic. The whole idea of spreading democracy feeds right back into that. We're not spreading democracy as well. Our state isn't. We, we are hopefully, <laughs> but we're spreading what the America, the American state wants. That's, that's really all it is. Democracy to the U S state is doing what the U S state says. That's a liberal. Yeah. That, that's that's heading down that path. Right. And that, that liberalism is is, I guess I'll use your word, an Ourobora, right? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's just it, you can't really have liberalism at the end yeah. of the day because human beings are collective creatures in nature. Everything human beings have ever achieved, they've done in a group from the time of hunter-gatherer civilization right up to today. If you look at the, the New York City skyline, every single building there is the collective result of thousands and thousands of people's collective labor. I mean, it, no one can point to anything in our modern world and say, well, I made that. I made that all by myself. You know, um, now some people might say, what about like a wood carver, like a craftsman? Well, he's using tools. <laughs> yeah, and those exactly. tools were made in a factory and shipped by, I mean, everything human beings do is collective. Well, you could make the case that, you know, I, I, I make documentaries and you could say, well, I make them all by myself. I, I film stuff. I research them. I do. But 
I film stuff. I'm using a camera. I, I edit it. I'm using software that a bunch of people made. Um, I, you know, research things, which means I'm reading tons and tons of books, tons of academic studies, news articles. All that stuff is made by other people. It's not me. So there is truly, like to your point, really nothing that is fully made by one person. And, and unfortunately, they want us to think like you can, like they, they don't want you to think that there's some, that, uh, that brings us back to alienation. Like ultimately the alienation from the process of producing, you don't understand, you, you have the specialization of labor, you don't understand where people are in the process. You don't understand that there's somebody other than you in the process. And ultimately that's, that's how they're justifying this market liberalism, which is of course, it's all, it's all fake. It's all, yeah. it's, it's, it's again, to use the word again, it's an Ouroboros. It's, it's eating its own tail. Yeah. And this is why ultimately I do think that the fact that there is an anti-imperialist block and the fact that there are a number of countries now that are tied in with the Belt and Road Initiative, with the Eurasian Economic Union, and with economies that are not run by profits and command, the anarchy of production, the chaos of the market, that lays the basis for there to be divisions within our ruling class. Um, you know, the fact that Jim Rogers was such a big outspoken supporter of peace with North Korea. Mm -hmm. Um, and now we also see sections of the military, uh, you know, like, you know, Tulsi Gabbard is active duty military. Michael Flynn comes out of the military. Uh, and these are individuals that don't want to have war with Russia and they want to get along with Russia. And they seem even also more interested in getting along with China, some of them. Uh, and, and that there are sections of the U.S. financial power structure uh, that realize that their, their hope is finding an alliance and, and kind of attaching themselves to this new emerging alternative economy. Guys, this is a pretty big waste. What are all these kids doing? You know, they were all sitting there ready to kill the guys, the kids on the other side. It was all steer, there wasn't much there. Then I went to the DMZ on the South Korean side, and my main impression was, what a waste. You know, why don't they just tear this down and let's have a K-pop concert. The bulk of the capitalist class in the United States just wants to make money. And if they, they, want to, they just want to make money, why not do business with Russia and China? Why not be part of the explosive, you know, anti-imperialist socialist bloc? But among the ultra monopolies that want to stay in power, they realize the only way they can maintain their monopoly is beating down and grinding the world into poverty. And Russia and China and Cuba and Venezuela and Iran are the biggest threat to that. So there is a division in the ruling class around this issue. And at the end of the day, that division kind of lays the basis for an opening for those of us who do want a better life for working families to enter on a strategic alliance and really build up an anti-monopoly coalition. I, I point out the, the four stars on the Chinese flag represent the block of four great classes. Mao understood the proletariat, the working class was not the majority in China, it was the peasantry, but even the, the, the middle class and the, and the national capitalists, those four stars on the Chinese flag represent this anti-imperialist or anti-monopoly coalition that Mao built in order to, to rescue China from imperialism and lead it to socialism. And that's what we should be doing in the United States. That's what William Z. Foster and the Communist Party understood their job was back in the day, to build an anti-monopoly coalition. And that's what we ought to be doing. We ought to be polarizing U.S. society, not around social and cultural issues, but around the issue of the imperialists and building a, a block of forces that will resist the imperialists. Obviously, we know that that's what you want to do. That is, that is it's a very general idea, though. What can an individual who is watching this do to move towards that in whether it's in a very small scale or something they can join that brings us to that on a larger scale well there is a very important small but growing layer in u.s politics the rage against the war machine rally that happened february 19th had a diverse number of speakers jimmy Dore spoke nick brana of the people's party max blumenthal tara reed this was a, a diverse coalition that's kind of centered around opposing not just the wars that they wage around the world, but also the low-wage police state they're trying to set up at home. 
Um, and that is the section of U.S. society. That is, that is the political current that I think we should be pouring all of our energy into. And a lot of it is, is a break with the left. A lot of it comes out of libertarianism. But ultimately, it's saying we're not going to accept your low-wage police state, and we're not going to accept your march toward World War III. And the woke left hates it, and the traditional neoconservative uh, right wing hates it. Um, and you know, some even in the Trump camp are not completely comfortable with it, but it's a layer that, that's growing, and they question the vaccine mandates, uh, and they question the lockdowns, and they, they also question the, the war drive, and they are opposed to the tech censorship, and now we see with the Twitter files, you know, all the censorship that was going on, and that, that this is starting to be the basis of some kind of anti-monopoly coalition. So if someone's watching this, that's where you should be putting your energy. You know, that, that's where you can go and talk to people. Um, and I've also noticed, and this is one thing that's worth pointing out, is that every political current in the United States is being divided right now. Uh, you know, the left, obviously there's big divisions, uh, but, you know, among the libertarians, you know, you have the Mises caucus, they're, you know, taking positions supporting Julian Assange, opposing the tech censorship, but then you have a lot of libertarians who are supporting it, right? And then uh, among conservatives, there's a similar divide. And that so we're starting to see a polarization in U.S. society. It's not about what ideology you believe in, but rather what you act, advocate in the here and now. Um, and that's, anyone can say they're anything. You know, anyone can say they believe in any ideology, but it's what positions do you take on the actual issues? And, and that's where the polarization increasingly is. What positions do you take on the actual issues? Are you for Julian Assange or are you against him? Are you for the tech censorship or are you against it? Are you for sending weapons to Ukraine or are you against it? Um, and that's very interesting. And it shows that the kind of coalitions that will emerge to challenge the low-wage police state in the wars are probably going to be very unique and interesting. Um, however, I do believe that Marxism, because it's the ideology that raised millions and hundreds of millions out of people out of poverty around the world, and you know the Chinese Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the Bolivarian Socialism in Latin America, I think Marxism is going to be an essential part of the anti-monopoly coalition that ultimately breaks the United States out of imperialism and moves the United States toward a, a healthy, uh, progressive illiberalism where the country comes together and we build ourselves up. So, in short, if there's something you want to do, I would encourage you to join the Center for Political innovation. That would be a first step. That would be ideal, yes. Yeah. Um, but I would also just encourage you to get involved um, with, you know, the Rage Against the War Machine efforts, uh, with with other efforts to promote these ideas, because we are entering a period where most people realize something is deeply wrong with their country. Something's deeply wrong, and they want to do something about it. And they're being told by the elite they should just go along with it. Not only are they being told to go along with it, they're imposed upon to build it. I mean, it's like you're practically required to have a Ukrainian flag. If you have a, a business or a, or, a, or a social institution, I mean, you know, you're practically required to have a Ukrainian flag. They're trying to impose their politics on us, make us carry these things out. And there's a lot of people that just say, I don't want to go along with this. I don't trust you. And uh, we need to speak to those people more than anybody. Well, that's Caleb Maupin. The book, Where Is America Going, is available now. Uh, it's great. I, I, I would definitely say uh, pick it up, join CPI, and uh, have, a, have a very lovely day. Thank you.